Well, hello and welcome. We're just starting fresh. Okay, so we're talking about rings. <clears throat> we got through all the different kinds of rings. The top two are usually the compression. The next one is the oil control. And then the last one is usually scraper. Okay. Uh, measurements. We got to take measurements on here. Measurements. One, you got the ring gap. And that is the end gap. So if we take a look at a ring, you know, a nice little circle. We're measuring this distance right there, that right there. Whatever that is, is what we're concerned with, that ring gap. Ring gap. We want to know what that is. Well, you got to, like everything else, make sure that you do it correctly. So as I showed you in class, you're going to take the ring, you're going to set it in the barrel, then you're going to take a piston, you're going to push it so that it's perfectly... Um, centered and not at an angle inside the cylinder <laughs> barrel and you're going to set it where the manufacturer wants you to have it it's like continental is only about an inch down like homing is a little bit further down so you want to make sure you remember exactly where continental like homing wants you to do it four inches. there you go was it four inches the measurement of the bore or four inches the measurement where they want the ring okay so um and would you guys do measure that gap? Feel the gauges. They make a tool. If you look at it on a side view, it looks like this. And it's really kind of cool. And it's got all the measurements on there. And you just drop it in there and wherever the ring happens to be. And you can just take the measurement right off of it. I like that. But we don't have one of those. All right. Um, <laughs> then we also have to do the side clearance. And as I explained to you in lab, you have to be very careful because if we do kind of a, a gap, right, the, the ring, right there, and this would be the land, not be the land, we have rings that are, I'll make the ring a different color. What kind of ring is that? Tapered, also called keystone. There we go. Keystone, yep. And so you have to make sure that you measure it completely flush, completely flush. Because if you've got, obviously, make another ring here. If we put the ring and we've got it kind of hanging out over here, this gap right here is tremendously bigger. You put a lot more feeler gauge in that one because it's sticking way out there than you could one little one right there. So you got to make sure that it's flush. And the light coming shows you how to, they have a little straight edge that they like you to put on there, little rubber bands and hold it. And so make sure you do it correctly. Um, all right. This one's kind of a funny one. So we'll talk about this. So all right, when you put them on a piston, so we'll let this be kind of the piston. And you have how many rings? Three. Okay, so we'll say that um, this is the way this, this sits in an engine. So this is the top of the top of the piston, right? So it's going to be different for you because you're building them in a vertical spot, but think about it sitting on, on the aircraft. You're not supposed to line up the gaps. So you have three rings, so you wouldn't want to put one gap, one gap, I wanted red, you know, all the gaps lined up right there. I've read different things. Some say you should put one there, then one here, and then another one, 180 out. So it's 180 each way. Um, does that make sense? So the first one's up, second one's down, third one. Okay, so they're technically the furthest apart. Um, I've had other people say, well, now if you put one here, then you put one here and one here. So they're, you know, split equally. <clears throat> the thing about it is, well, it's funny. So in, uh, in aviation, Every every annual, we're supposed to do a compression check on an engine, or if we suspect there's a problem with the engine, we do a differential compression check. And it, unlike an automobile or car, um, when you do a compression check, you put a gauge on there and you crank the engine, right? You see just how much pressure you can create out of this air pump. We don't do that in aviation for probably the biggest reason is you don't want that prop spinning around out there in front of you. And I don't know, but so we use a differential compression tester, which is a tester with two gauges on it. Let me see what I got here. Do this one. 
Kind of difference with age. Look at all we got. There we go, differential compression tester. Yeah. Let me see. That's what you were doing. But uh, we put 80 pounds of pressure in it, and there's a little orifice here so that the cylinder will slowly fill up. And you're comparing how much will the cylinder hold to how much you put in. So if I put in 80 pounds and it holds 80 pounds, well, I've got no leakage at all. Now, when you, you guys did your valves, we did it on a bench, so all we're testing is the valves. Well, of course, on an engine, you've got the valves and the rings. So let's just say you're, you're getting, you know, 60 over 80, which means you're putting in 80, it's holding 60. And so you listen, you don't hear anything come out of the exhaust, nothing coming out of the uh, carburetor. So where is it leaking? Rings. Rings. All right. And the general consensus is, oh, I've got to be careful how I say this. Um, things have changed a lot over the years. Uh, Larry's going to get way more into differential checks. I used to and go through all the numbers, but I'm just going to leave that for him because I have enough to cover. But in a nutshell, um, there are certain numbers that we're supposed to hit. And we'll just say, um, let's say se anything 70 over 80 is better. Well, it used to be that way. It is more for Lycoming. And if you use 4313, they follow suit. But Continental is so different anymore. And, that's, and this is actually a, a differential tester that's because of the way Continental does stuff. What you actually do is without anything connected to the hose, you hit the pressurization, you turn this knob up to 80, and you open this master orifice so the air comes through the orifice, down and out, and just bleeds out, right? So it's just hissing away. And you see what this gauge says. And it, whatever this gauge says is going to be a little different depending on the day, the hose you're using, the air compressor. Um, but it's usually around 38, 40 PSI. And so that becomes your bottom. So anything better than this whatever master orifice reading, let's say it was 40, 40 PSI that day, well, then I'm going to turn the master orifice off, plug it into my cylinder, pressurize it to 80, and as long as my cylinder is better than 40 over 80, Continental says it's fine. Uh, but you have to follow up anyway with a bore scope and do other checks is where Lycoming doesn't require that. Uh, the point that I'm trying to get to here is, number one, things have changed rapidly. So, you know, you got to be careful when you're talking, you know, the old timers, this is the way we always do it. You know, it's, it's, things have changed a lot and you have to bore scope Continentals now every year. But, uh, so it used to be, and, and even Continental does, if you get too low of a reading, Continental says, well, just go fly it for a little bit or run it for a little bit and see what happens. Right. And so what really changes readings, especially on the leakage past the rings is if you get some oil in there, you know, old timer car guys will tell you, you spray a little oil in the cylinder and try it again and pressure would come way up because the oil will help seal it, right? Um, so that's one thing. If you run the engine, you can end up getting a little more oil in there and help seal it, whatever. But some people would say, well, it's because the rings are lined up. And I don't know, I just kind of have to think that air kind of finds its way around. You know, if I had a gap here and a gap here and then another gap here, I feel that the air could find its way through and around and over and through and down. Because air can move pretty good. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. <laughs> so I always kind of secretly laugh because I'm like, I think air can turn the corner. I really do. I mean, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a scientist or what not, but I think air can turn the corner. So the like ring gaps lining up and say, so say, well, you run it and then the ring gaps kind of rotate and then they're not lined up and then you won't get the leakage anymore. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, so I tell you that to not tell you that. Also, rings rotate. They're supposed to migrate. Um, I think I have it in my notes somewhere about how often they do because I don't remember off the top of my head. Oh, I do, right in front of me. Once around every five to seven minutes. And I know for a fact that they rotate because when I've worked on cylinders for half my life and I take them out, if they did it, that top ring, when it's going towards the head, would leave a unworn spot. And the bottom ring, when it goes back the furthest, there'd be a little unworn spot. And it doesn't happen. So now I know that they rotate. There we go. All right. So we're doing that. Um, we say, oh, measurements, installation.
installation because measurements was v measurements was vi this x there you go and oil scraper was five yeah installation all right so rings should be in, all right but i will say this and i agree with this rings should be installed rings should be installed so far i'm sure you agree with that statement yeah. all right yeah. That's at number one. Yeah, Rings should be installed <laughs> so the gaps are not aligned. So the gaps are not aligned. That makes sense, right? Why, why start them out that way? Um, and that's all I say about that. With it. Now I'll tell you what I do. So we can get rid of all this here. So I think about how the piston is going to be setting. And this is just something I came up with on my own. And what I do is I put the gap for the oil control ring, so it's here. So oil control gap. Because there's going to be a fair amount of oil in the bottom of the cylinder. Oh, if you do it right, there's gonna be quite a bit. I put a lot in. So I think, well, we should put the oil control gap on the top where there's no oil. That makes sense to me. And then, after that, I don't care. You know, there have been days where I've been in the mood where I'm like, well, then I'll put one here and then one here. And then I thought about it, and the next time I did something, I'm like, nah, I kind of liked the gap over here and the gap over here so that, you know, the oil down here doesn't go through any of the gaps. And so I tend to do it more that way. But I don't think you're wrong. If they're moving around at a rate of one to every seven minutes, eventually they're going to be all over the place anyway. And so it doesn't matter. I think the only thing that matters is to get the oil control ring up. And even then, it wouldn't matter a whole lot. If it did, they would tell you, and they don't, so it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, rings rotate, hopefully. R O T A T, rotate uh, at a rate of once around every. five to seven minutes. I should work that out to an RPM, or RPL, H. And I have this in my notes, so I'll just tell you, we talked about it, if rings, if rings do align, ring gaps, ring gaps do align, there we go. Um, compression reading, may be low. Well, I don't know about that. Um, may be low. So what are you going to do? Take Front. the piston out and move the rings. No. <laughs> nope. Uh, do a ground run. Do a ground run. Check it later. If you follow the Continental uh, M0 manual, it'll explain exactly what to do. If your reading is this, then run it. If it's this, then fly it. If it's this, you know, and it'll go right down and recheck in so many hours. But you're always going to start with a boroscope after the reading, regardless of what you get. If they do a line, can't you just run it for five to seven minutes and then they'll be moved? That's why Continental says just go run it for a little while. <laughs> they don't want you taking the cylinders apart. <laughs> All right, so this is big three, way out here in the, the, the end over there. And a whole new thing. So now we're going to talk about piston pins. We're going to try and spell it right. P I S T O. Piston pins. You did what in your pin? Sometimes called wrist pins. Obviously, it connects. Connects the. What did you say? The no. The Conrad. To the piston. piston. I had to change it just because you said it right the first time. <laughs> All right, uh, made of high strength steel, made of high strength steel. Um, they are hollow. Hollow. Um, three classifications. We have the stationary, 
which means not free to move. Not free to move. And locked to the piston pin boss. I'll say locked to the piston because it's shorter to write that. I am not aware of any aviation piston pins that are like that, which doesn't mean that there isn't. It just means that I'm not aware of them. Semi-floating. They are slotted. Slotted and locked to the rod. I am not familiar of any aviation <laughs> connecting rods or piston pins that are like that. Again, doesn't mean they're not there. It just means I'm not. Ooh, wait a minute. So I worked on one engine that had something like that. I don't remember it anymore, so it doesn't count. And then there's full floating. Which is free to float. Free to float. They are not locked to anything. They are not locked to the piston. They're not locked to the connecting rod. This one is the most common in aircraft. So, if you think about the ones that are, that are somehow locked, they're not free to rotate, go back and forth within the piston, which means they don't hit the sidewall of the cylinder. But if you have free floating, they're going to free to float until they knock into the cylinder wall. They kind of go the other way, knock into the cylinder wall. So they're always kind of knocking into the cylinder wall. So you got to think about what's on the edge of them. And what do you guys have? Caps. Caps. And caps were a bit of an issue. Let's go to some piston pin caps. There we go. Piston pin. This one on the left is a Continental, one on the right is a Lycoming. These Continental ones are weird. Um, okay, so these caps, that's a one piece cap. Oh yeah, right in front of me. That's a one-piece cap. They do not come apart. One piece of aluminum goes all the way through this hollow and out the other end. I've only seen one or two where it's broken and they come out. In my opinion and experience, these are the best. I just don't see problems with these. Um, I'm sure problems have happened, but it's rare that I've ever really seen a problem with one of these things. Well, I don't pass it around. There you go. It just looks like that. Also, we're going to get in a fight, right? Yeah. 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 Supposed to go down the street, man. You know, I'm backing off. We got access to all these like heavy duty yeah. pieces of metal that we can use. Yeah. Uh, and I think I said this was a. I think I just said this was a uh, Lycoming. It's not. It's a Continental. It's a small Continental. Uh, C85, 65, 0200, 0300. They use the small ones. Uh, these these plugs come out. Um, I want to say lately they've been. They're not. It's a more of a press fit, so you don't like you guys have. They come out, come out. These don't. They're not supposed to. I've seen counterfeit ones that come out real easy. I've got them from Lycoming. They don't come out. Or Continental. They don't come out. But I've seen problems with these. The weirdest one I ever saw was, and it was the strangest damn thing. You know those Easter egg candies you get that look like little footballs? Mm -hmm. It looked exactly like that. Same size, same shape. Same. It didn't taste like it, but it was, I'm like, the hell, it's a little chocolate candy, but there was no piston pin plug. And what had happened, we were getting a high uh, aluminum content, or the owner was, wasn't my problem. A high uh, aluminum content. So on the smaller Continentals, usually when it's high aluminum content, con high aluminum content, I suspect piston pin plugs, and I'm almost never wrong on that one. And this particular one, we pulled the cylinders until we just found that thing. It had been chewing up that that piston pin plug. So is that just the bouncing back and forth? I don't know what was causing it. You know, like I said, in the small Continental world, there's a lot of counterfeit parts, a lot. And when you buy parts or some place I shouldn't they don't call them counterfeit they call it NOS new old stock 
<laughs> which is to say that it's new to you, old to them. Something, yeah. Well, it could be recently <laughs> made, but uh, yeah, there are places that sell it. You pull this stuff, and especially the 65s, because Continental, I don't think, really services them anymore. But um, I don't think I think they're just counterfeit parts, and the parts don't fit well, and so the plug starts rattling back and forth inside the, the plug in the in the piston pin, and that starts wear, and then it ex just accelerates. That's why you just spend the money when you can. Hey, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Lycoming, boy, have they had some issues. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, let me see if I have it right. I don't remember, but it was something like this. So you've got the aluminum bronze plug, and it's kind of a goldish color. And then you got the aluminum ones that look exactly like that, but they're aluminum color. And then you have the piloted ones. And this is my memory, and I could be a little wrong. If you go way back in time, they had these aluminum bronze ones. And uh, they're, they're quite a bit heavier. And like I said, this is my memory. And somebody got the idea that they didn't want to use those anymore. So they went to these, and oh, I remember these. I mean, we were just, you know, had a lot of these. And this was the thing, or always have the aluminum ones. I really never saw any of these when I got in the field, but I sure saw a lot of these aluminum ones. Then they started having some sort of problem with them. I don't, I never did, but so they went to these piloted ones. See, these right here, they're a little bit of a booger to use when you're installing the engine because they don't actually go into the piston pin it's like a very tiny little, and you got to get it just right in the hole. Here's a trick to it. You just slide the piston pin out and use that to push the piston pin back in, and it works just fine. Um, but anyway, so they, they, they fit. Their fit is dependent upon being in the piston pin boss. So the piston pin boss is where that plug is going to really move around in there. So you, you dependent upon the piston, the piston boss has to be right, and the plug has to be right, and because it's fitting like a piston pin. So, but apparently they had some problems with that, but they solved it by going over here to these uh, LW11775 aluminum piston pin plugs, which actually pilot inside of the piston pin, which caused all kinds of problems. And so their solution was to use the aluminum bronze piston pin plug. So, yeah. I think the only thing I might be getting wrong on that is how old these were, but I'm pretty sure those were the really old design. And then they went full circle. I didn't see these out in the field for very long, these piloted ones. And then there was a problem with, um, oh yeah, things right there. And individual soldiers replaced both piston pin plugs and complete engine replaced. Yeah, the, there was a weight issue and then it just became this huge problem. Oh, all right, I think that's piston pin plugs. So what's the takeaway on that? Um, be very careful about changing piston pin plugs in a light combing. Make sure you know what you're doing. Read the service instructions. There's not a lot of great information in the overhaul manual. Most of the good information is in service bulletins, letters, and instructions. You have to follow those. You have to be up on them because, boy, they just won't change the part manual, the IPC, if you will, integrated parts catalog, and they don't really change the overhaul manual very often. You've got to go service bulletin instructions. All right, what do you do if you can't get a piston pin out? Buy a tool. You know, parts are called for working on it. Don't take a big thing and start driving on it. What are you going to bend? The rod. You're going to bend the rod. What's that? Twist or convergence? Convergence. Yep, you're going to add all kind of convergence. They do make this piston pin removal tool. I didn't have one of these. Um, I showed you guys how to do it, which I thought was kind of cool. I just warm it up a little bit. It's just a little bit warm. It'll just slide right out. Like on a bald monkey, like butter on a bald monkey, come right out. Well, now you have. Always say it. Oh yeah, I've heard it. Say it often, but I'll always say it. I'm not saying it right now. All right, what do we got? Full floating, free to float, most common in aircraft. Um, so there is that. You guys hopefully measured it. There is the piston pin with plugs in cylinder, how much side clearance there is. So that's got to be a thing. All right, uh, what about piston pin retainers? Piston pin retainers. Again, I have only dealt with piston pin plugs, never retainers, but it could have retainers. And it keeps 
the pin, piston pin, from damaging cylinder wall. Cylinder wall. Um, and how would you do that? So if you were going to use retainers, you would not use piston pin plugs. You would just use some sort of clip. So you could use a circlet. Circlets or snap rings. Snap rings. And that would fit in the groove of a piston pin. So that they fit in groove a piston pin. Boss. Piston pin boss. And of course what I just talked about. Piston pin plugs. which are most common in aircraft. Most common, um, and they're usually made of a non-ferrous, oh, they're always made of a non-ferrous metal. What does non-ferrous mean? It doesn't have ferrous in it. What is ferrous? Iron. Iron. Uh, I threw this one in here. Piston pin fit. Ah, oh, that's kind of a. I, I mentioned it in lab, and this is works with anything. And I don't know why it made me think of it here, but I did while I was writing this. So I thought, well, I'll do that. So piston pin. So usually a push fit. Push fit. That's kind of a. So there's a push fit and a press fit. So a press fit means you need to use a press. 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 And a push fit means you can push, push it in. There you go. So this is just my observation right here. 0 0.001 is about the smallest clearance Clearance, you can assemble without a press or heating one and cooling the other. Point zero zero two will allow uh, sliding. So, the, like taking a piston pin in the conrod, you can actually slide it back and forth without too much effort or I should say no effort, they'll slide back and forth. Um, but with almost no play. So that means you then take it and you kind of try and rock the piston pin inside the bushing or whatever component you have. You just do it and you, I think I feel just the slightest bit of play. That's about two thousandths. So it slides back and forth freely. I can't really feel, but maybe just a little bit of play. You're talking about two thousandths. And let me see, 0 0.003 um, will have um, perceivable side play. But not very much. Uh, wall thickness. Um, you got to be careful with lycoming because they had various wall thicknesses so lycoming lycoming has multiple um, combinations combinations of piston pins and plugs and that's what we talked about just a second ago. So we've got heavy, heavy wall piston pin. Um, in your measurements, did you have to determine if you had a heavy or a light, a thin wall piston pin? Yes. Yeah. And you have a? Who says heavy? Huh? Heavy, 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 heavy. Who says light? Who says I don't remember any of this? I'm right on the oh, okay. <laughs> Let's 
let's see here. Yeah, we already did that. Aw, that piston pin is on its side. I can't. I can see it. There we go. Yeah, but I wanted to show you the picture right here. The mouse won't show up. See that piston pin, how thick it is? That is really thick. Does yours look like that? No, it does not. So that one right there is the... That's a damn thick wall pin. All right, they are thick. They are very thick. So when you see a thick one, you know that's a thick one. All right, so heavy, uh, I have the part numbers here, which I'm not gonna tell you because why would I do that? And then the thin wall, thin wall, so. And we see four, we had piston pin plugs. When you're working around engines or anything in aviation really, especially, they often throw things out at you that is just like you're supposed to know. And we talked about that. You know, it's like, oh, if you got the heavy wall pistons or the high crush bearings or the, you know, the per mold crankcase, or the sand cast crankcase, or, you know, the, the D drive uh, um, oil pump, or, you know, just throw out these things like, what? All right, that is where you just have to train yourself to stop and say, I don't know what that word means, no matter what it is. Um, how about the word subsequent? What does the word subsequent mean? Like, yeah, following. Like, it happens because of this, kind of, without, like, because of. Is it later or before? Later. Yeah. Subsequent. It's like subsequent. So, if, okay, so if I said the year 2000 or subsequent, does that mean 2000 to now or 2000 before? 2000 to now. 2000 to now, okay. So I remember when I got a call from, I think the FAA got involved on this one because somebody had not done airworthiness directives correctly because it was this serial number or subsequent. And they said, oh, no, no, it's this serial number and it's after that serial number, so that doesn't count. And so they weren't doing any ADs on this airplane because it was subsequent. Well, subsequent means after. It's like, well, if you don't know, it's okay. Just ask somebody, you know, or pull out a dictionary or... <laughs> I mean, you got to remember this is before the days of Google, so, you know, and cell phones, so you could just always go, subsequent means, I mean, you had to go in the office and ask for a dictionary. But, man, I'd rather go in the office and ask for a dictionary than be standing in front of, the, you know, the FAA or a judge or, you know, a court of inquiry about, uh, so tell us, what do you think subsequent means? So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. yeah, I can't read. Can't blame me. <laughs> uh, we're on piston pin plugs. Um, so large bore, large bore. Uh, TCM uses um, piston pins with non removable. plugs and then there's some of you going want to bet <laughs> oh, I got it. <laughs> yeah oh yeah no that, that's coming out trust me <laughs> um, small bore used pressed pressed in plugs um, and light combing that's several different types. And you can't just change them. Service instruction, it was one, two, six, seven. I'm just gonna put that in running notes rather than bore you with all the details about the part numbers and this and that, which for some reason I thought at one point in my lifetime would have been a good idea. Because it's two, seven, the 72198 was your aluminum bronze, your 6028 is, uh, yeah, but you can't just mix and match. Put that do not mix and match. Do not mix, mix and match. You gotta match them, so I don't know. Do not, do not say mix and match. Do not mix. 
Do not mix and match. Yeah, do not mix. And you should match. But the saying is, don't mix and match. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. That makes no sense. Yeah. I know. I didn't realize that until I wrote it. Don't mix and match. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to match them. Well, you said don't, don't mix, mix and match. Mix. Huh? <laughs> don't mix and mix. Don't mix and mix, yes. Don't mix and mix. Do not mix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> makes more sense. Yeah, is it mix and is it mismatch or mix, mix and mismatch? mismatch? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's mismatch. Mismatch. Yeah, probably yeah. what it is. Yeah. Not mismatch. <laughs> <laughs> cylinder barrels. All right, so we're talking about the cylinder barrel. For the most part, unless you're working on Franklin's, apparently. <laughs> I, do have a, I know you can't tell, can you? <laughs> Nobody knows. You can tell it's not an S because. <laughs> it's an a dollar sign. You guys are mean. Just a look at it. Just grab it. I need you to, to record, record you saying the. Um, I need to go down to the Megalomart and get me a WD 40 and tap and die. <laughs> Okay, back on track. <laughs> Cylinder barrel. Modern engines, unless it's Franklin, which isn't a modern engine. Franklin's one of the only ones that I know that did the weird, weirdness. They're all like this. No matter if it's a big bore, a little bore, whatever. Continental, like coming, Pratt and Whitney, they all do the same thing. You've got a steel barrel with, and that goes up to here, steel, and from here to here, it's just threads. And so if I get this really hot, I can just unscrew it. Oh, and it just unscrews. Cool. And in fact, in my shop, when uh, we were working on cylinders and we heated them, one thing I didn't show you guys is we would always make an index mark on the barrel and the head because when you're machining it and it's hot, you sometimes will twist them a little bit. And if you twist it a little bit, then it gets locked onto the engine right here, right? And then if the head is cocked a little bit, nothing lines up. And it's like if you have a six cylinder this, and it goes in the middle, it'll funk the other two and it just doesn't work. Always got to make sure they're lined up. So we're talking about the cylinder barrel, the steel part down here, which is screwed onto here. That's right up to there. Really? Stop it. Yes. <laughs> For realsies. I actually did not know that. What? That blew my mind. Is that A? No, it's I. Don't ask me why. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll tell you why. I don't know what it is with Microsoft Word. Like sometimes I'll stop like right here for the day and I'll pick it up the next day and I'll hit the ta the next indent. It'll just go I. I'm like, well, I wanted it to be A and it just won't do it. And I'm like, all right, then screw it. We're all switching gears then. Uh, high strength steel alloy. Um, obviously it has cooling fins. It's cooling fins to dissipate heat and to play a nice little song and that's right next to the microphone too. See? it's the song of my people here we go isn't that a meme though yeah, yeah. Something, like that. something like that all right surface The surface. All right, there's several different types of surfaces. Now I'm talking about what's inside or right here. All right. So to start off with, whatever, um, <laughs> material. <laughs> Materials. All right. We got non. I should just put non-plated. Non-plated means it doesn't have any plating. I don't know. I just saw it on a YouTube like video and wrote it down. You see in They're all plated gold. It's not real. <laughs> Non-plated means it doesn't have plating on it. What does that mean? It means this I plain steel. Do I have to go back? Last one. It said uh, uh, non-plated. 
Here, I'll write it right here. So, non-plated. Non-plated. All right. So, non-plated. In other words, it is just plain old steel. Nothing. They made it done steel. Plain steel. Um, problem with that is it has poor wear characteristics. All right. Other than plain steel and the non-plated, you have nitriding. Nitride. What great, great wear characteristics. Yay! Rusts easily. Very easily. And now they have a new thing out. To me, it's new. Black oxide. I don't have any notes. It, it, it's a rust preventative. Yes, it's black on the inside. It doesn't rust as much. So the funny thing here, and I'm going to write this down. As far as I know, this is the way it went. Small continental cylinders were plain steel, possibly nitrided, and all the bigger bores were nitrided. But yet Continental didn't say anything about it. It's like those are our cylinders. That's just what they are. Are they nitrided? Well, yeah, don't worry about it. But Lycoming was kind of weird about it. They had a product line that wasn't nitrided. They were plain steel. And then they had a big deal about the ones that were nitrided. So they actually color code theirs that are nitrided with a little blue stripe. And then the ones that were plain steel, it, they didn't. So they actually had this distinction. And memory serves me the way you actually told the difference between them, if you didn't know, is that the um, nitrided were choked and the plain steel were just were not choked. But Continental has never made a thing about it, never really discussed it. it never, it's just, th that's our cylinder. Don't worry about it. I kind of like that, is where, like I said, Lycoming had some that were and some were not. The lower horsepower were not, the higher horsepower were. Then we got into plated cylinders. Now, plating is not a new thing. Plating goes way back into, I think, in the World War II era, where, and I don't know what necessarily came first, but plating is used for two things. And I believe there was even a period of time where you could custom order your factory engines with plating. And so what they would do is they would actually plate the inside of this with chrome. But it's called channel chrome, and if you Bring it in. Dang it. Wait, no, it's an office. <laughs> 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 Another 30 minutes will go on break. All right. All right, I'm tired of you too.